Welcome to Revolutions Weekly, where we dive into the details of our many periodic revolutions, elections. I'm your host, Alvin, and today we're going to be continuing our talk about the 2020 U.S. election. So in this third and final part of our three-part series on the U.S. election, we're going to be talking about what happens after the election. So from the day Joe Biden gets elected all the way to the day he gets inaugurated. Now, in my original recording of this, I had actually, you know, like, made speculations in regards to what would happen after, you know, said election win, you know, all the scenarios and things like that. But I think now with, you know, like I said, hindsight, we know now that we actually know what happens and what is happening, I think, and I feel that, you know, this episode will be like a lot more factual in nature, I guess. So anyways, let's start from the day itself. So like I said, you know, like Joe Biden won with 306 electoral votes, Donald Trump with 232, and then, you know, Joe Biden winning the popular vote by over 7 million, yada, yada, yada. And then immediately after, you know, like, I mean, first of all, Trump didn't even concede. You know, it's like well, most candidates historically would have, you know, made this whole like speech, you know, you know, like Hillary did it the last time and everybody else did it before that, where it's like, they would say, oh, you know, it's like it was a good campaign. We find a good campaign, but, you know, I would like to congratulate my opponent, my, the other candidates. So it's like, so there's always like this, like, tradition you could call it a tradition where it's like the other candidate would like concede immediately after the election results came in, you know, after a certain amount of time. But with Donald Trump, what is interesting was that, you know, he didn't concede. And in fact, it's not just that he didn't, didn't concede, it's that he actually claimed he won, <laughs> which is interesting to say the least. You know, it's like all this claim about the voter fraud, about, about like all the mailing mail-in ballots being like, you know, counted incorrectly all of the things i think it's like and because of that i think him and his legal team were like oh you know we're, 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 we're gonna actually like fight you know the results dispute the results of these elections and so you know they brought up over 50 cases to courts all over the country you know things like some of them alleging oh you know it's like you didn't count correctly or like someone was like oh you know our people weren't allowed in the room where they were counting you know suspicious things there and then there's also like other things peddled by like conspiracy websites, you know, about how, oh, you know, there was thousands of ballots for Biden found here and there and everywhere. So it's like, they were all over the place with this. But I think it's like, ultimately out of like the 50 cases that they brought up, I think only two or three of them, they actually won. Most of them got thrown out of the court because, well, there was simply no evidence. So, you know, the few that they won were like very procedural, you know, things that like I said, you know, oh, you know, there wasn't people in the rooms when they were counting it. I mean, in the end, they did manage to actually get the ballots recounted in some states because the margins were really tight in those particular states. But of course, I think Biden's lead was like such that even a recount wouldn't, you know, have no chance of succeeding in this in that regard. So I think it's like it was in, you know, like Georgia, it was in Pennsylvania, I think most notably where, you know, they did actually recount the ballots, but in the end, you know, they didn't actually find anything. And it's like, and like I said, it's like Joe Biden's lead at that point was already like pretty decently ahead. I mean, in most states, he was probably leading by about eight to 15,000 votes, which looking at past American elections are actually, you know, pretty abysmal numbers. And, you know, just goes to show like how polarized the country has actually become over the years. But, you know, I think it's like it was nevertheless high enough. It was over the margin of error to where I think it's like any recount would have had no chance of actually making up the lost numbers. So moving on from that, of course, you know, of course, to this day, Trump still hasn't conceded. Of course, I don't know what he thinks in his own head, but, you know, like the Trump people, do you know, things like they definitely still believe that Trump is the rightful president. So you know, the fact that a segment of the Republican Party doesn't even believe that Joe Biden is president is of course troubling, and we'll get to that in a bit. So you know, I think it's like then after the election, there is like an, a smaller election, and this is the election. You know, people were like talking about right after the big one finished. In that, you know, things like in the Senate. So currently, Democrats have control of the Senate, and now I'll tell you why. So for the last few years, the Senate has always been controlled by the Republicans in that they have a majority of like a few seats. And because of that, you know, it's like, so they have control of the Senate. Now, I think the Republicans, I think, lost either. I think they lost one seat. So that was in Arizona to Mark Kelly, who, who was an astronaut and who registered as a Democrat. 
So they lost the seat, one seat there. And now Democrats plus independents, you know, Bernie Sanders and one other guy. So it's like, so that, so that's 48 people. And Republicans now have 50 seats. So there's two seats left up for grabs, basically. And these two seats, coincidentally, are both in Georgia. Hence, we have the Georgia runoff elections, where there's two Republican incumbent senators, just like David Perdue and Kelly Loeffner. So it's like, so they're up for re-election. But at the same time, we also have Democrats, you know, John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock. So of course, you know, I think Georgia, historically being a red state, you know, people would think, oh, you know, it's a, it's a safe Republican election. So there's no way Democrats would be able to take the Senate. This is bearing in mind the fact that prior to the election, the polls showed the Democrats would have been able to have a thumping victory in the Senate to a point where they could even like have like a three, four seat extra in their majority. But of course that didn't happen. So now Democratic majority control of the Senate now rested in this one election. That's why you saw, you know, resources being poured into Georgia like crazy, where it's like, and people all over the country were just donating, were just volunteering, you know, like to actually like, in, on, on the Democratic side, to make, make sure that, you know, Democrats would actually be able to control the Senate. Because even though Biden is president, and even though Democrats have the House, I think it's like, you know, like with the Senate, you know, it would complete everything in a sense where it's like, in theory, Democrats could pass anything they, they wanted as a result of that. And, you know, I think it's like the biggest, and like the biggest message that was put out in the campaign was, oh, you know, we're going to give you $2,000 checks. Now the $2,000 check conversation was actually started by Trump, who, you know, I think it's like after, right after they passed the $600 checks, you know, passed by, you know, like the efforts of Bernie Sanders and Josh Hawley, so Democrat, so, you know, independent Democrat and Republican. So because of that effort, you know, they were able to get $600. But now when Donald Trump out of nowhere came out and said, I want 2000 so that kind of, for a while, steered the conversation in this particular election. And it got to a point where both sides were saying, yeah, you know, I'm for $2,000 checks. But it was the Democrats who were explicitly saying, you know, yes, you know, let's give everyone $2,000 checks. And so with that closing message in that particular election, it was no wonder that they were actually able to win. Now, bearing in mind that, you know, before this particular, before the November 6th election, the big presidential election, you know, people were saying, oh, you know, Georgia is a safe state. There's no way Democrats could win. But if you remember what I said last episode, it was that, you know, Georgia turned blue, you know, for, a first, for the first time in like over 20 years. So of course, you know, with this new precedent, then, you know, Demo then Georgia all of a sudden became winnable. So because of that, there was an actual effort put into winning the state. And I think ultimately what, what really done, what really did it for the Democrats, bearing in mind that, you know, in the previous November 6th election, it was a slim margin in terms of like the results. Now, because of that slim margin, they've had to do this runoff election and it was literally within 1%. So of course, you know, but because none of the candidates reached over 50%. So this is for the John Ossoff election where it's like one of them was like within 1%. The other one was like more of an open primary where it's like, 10, 20 candidates got to run. Then of course, you know, like Kelly Loeffner, like, you know, was able to get over 40% of the vote, not 50 though. And then in second place, it was Raphael Warnock who was able to get 33% of the vote. Now, of course, you know, I think it's like at that point, all the Democrat, Democratic vote, of course, would have consolidated into, you know, Warnock for that particular seat. So anyways, it was slim results to begin with. So all they needed to do was to convert just enough people to actually win the election. And I think they actually did in the end. And I think it's like, it's not, and I, I, I personally don't think it's not because of like some messaging with like, oh, you know, like Trump and the Republicans are like a unique evil and all these kinds of things. No, because that doesn't really resonate with most Americans and most people. I think like the message that ultimately did it was like I said, the, the $2,000 check. And with that kind of closing message, of course they were able to pull out because they literally said, you know, if you vote for us, we will give you $2,000 checks. And you know, with just how bad COVID has affected everyone and everything, ultimately, you know, people took the gamble and they said, fine, you know, we'll vote for you. So I think that ultimately was a, was what was enough, was what did it, pushed them over the finish line. And just one more point about this particular election. The most interesting thing I think about it is the fact that it's even a race, that it's even that close. 
you know, I think it's like David Perdue is like a pretty, you know, a standard establishment Republican. And I think it's like, you know, as usual, pretty corrupt. And I think Kelly Loeffner is actually the richest senator in the U.S. Senate or was. So I think it's like she has like mansions and things like that. So I th there was actually an issue earlier in the year where right after, you know, getting a briefing on COVID and knowing the implications, she immediately sold a whole bunch of like her stock. So she was basically doing insider trading, which is illegal. And the fact that this was happening around February, so around the time Trump and the Republicans were actually denying the full implications of COVID, you know, like it just rubs people in the wrong way and kind of like even paints them in some instances as like nefarious actors. So, you know, the fact that you have these two horrible characters and, you know, I think it's like John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock. I think it's like we don't know what they're going to do in the office, but, you know, they seem like decent people. So it's like the fact that it's even a race was actually really interesting. So anyway, so after that, you know, Democrats have the Senate, although it was 50 50, you know, it's like so there is like a deadlock there. But in the American system, the vice president, Kamala Harris, gets to be the tiebreaker vote. So because of that, Democrats, you know, de facto have control of the Senate. Now, of course, right after, you know, like this big win in Georgia, of course, you know, there was like a lot of like the procedural things which, you know, which was needed to make Joe Biden president. So, of course, you know, like the Electoral College needed to meet, actually convene. And this, this happened in December where it's like they, they just convened and they met. This is it's a formality where it's like and then they just pretend to vote. But anyways, you know, it's like just to confirm that Biden's win, basically, in that particular instance. And then so that happened and it just passed. Then in January 6th, what was supposed to happen was that the Senate was supposed to take the results given by the Electoral College and just vote unanimously in favor of it. In a sense, you know, just it's a rubber stamp where it's like, yeah, they just said, yes, you know, Joe Biden won, he's the president, yada, yada, yada. So that was supposed to be done, you know, like no issues, be out in a, in a whimper, you know, because historically that's been the case. But what we have instead, and what honestly I could not have anticipated was that what we have instead was the huge riot in Capitol Hill you know, or insurrection, whatever you like to call it. But anyways, we have this huge riot in Capitol Hill, where it's like Trump supporters were like barging into the halls of the House and the Senate. You know, senators and representatives had to like hide for, for their lives, basically. It was it, it was hectic in a sense where it's like, I think it was like the since 1812. 1812 was the only other time that, you know, like that any kind of force was able to yeah, actually barge into the Capitol building at all. You know, and this was like when the British troops were like doing it. This was like in the War of 1812, and that was when the Capitol building was burnt down. So in another sense, in a sense of like actual an actual insurrection, this was the first time that actual Americans were actually barging into the Capitol building and, you know, ca causing like a whole ruckus that whole day, basically. It was interesting to see, to say the least, because in third world countries, those kinds of sites are, you know, pretty normal. They're, they're expected, even. So it's interesting and quite ironic, frankly, to see that happen in the American context. And, you know, I think it's like before the election, or it's like after the election, right after, I've, I kept talking about the democratic civil war between progressives and moderates, which is for all to see in the primaries. Now, what became really apparent after the election was that, you know, that also a civil war was happening as well in the Republican side, namely between standard establishment Republicans and the Trump Republicans. Now, policy wise, you know, like Trump, you know, was basically like any typical Republican president, cut regulation, you know, like cut taxes for the wealthy, mind you, all of the same things, continued wars, so and so, so and so. So, unlike in the Democratic side, where the progressives and moderates disagreed on policy, on the Republican side, the Trump Republicans and the establishment Republicans disagreed more on like cultural things, where it's like Trump is like this really brash, this look this really, I was like mean, but it's like it's really brash, really, you know, like has no respect for civility, for decorum, all these kinds of things. You know, he's willing to mess everything up. 
Now it's like it's this kind of like attitude that he brings into politics. It's like this cultural bubble that is created around him, so with conspiracy theories, you know, QAnon and all and all these kinds of things, you know, versus the establishment Republicans, the nor the quote unquote normal Republicans who who also believe in the same policies. Not really believe, but it's like the politicians at least believe in the same policies. But you know, but but they do have respect for civility, for decorum, and all these kinds of things. Now, mind you, they're both in terms of like their manifestation, they're both you know pretty bad. I think it's like what what you have here essentially is is really interesting. Where it's like in the Democratic side, you have a tug for the left, whereas in the Republican side, you have a tug for the right. Now, of course, you know when you go left, the tendency is to say, oh, you know, we want more accountability, we want more, we want better policies, basically. But in the right, you know. Every, you have a more authoritarian tilt where it's like, oh, you know, like, you know, like whatever Trump says is correct. You know, Trump is our daddy, quote unquote. So basically, you know, it's it's really interesting to say the least. So it's like, you know, it's like anything can happen. You could, you could, you could kick me out of my house. You could raise my taxes. You could do whatever you want. I don't care. But as long as it's Trump doing it, I support it, which is very different from what progressives want, you know, on the Democratic side. So, you know, this was brewing. This was apparent after the election. So, but, you know, with the insurrection happening, what was initially supposed to be like a theoretical project, you know, two, three years down the line, which was supposed to be like a theoretical phenomenon two, three years down the line, ended up happening immediately. Immediately. So I think it's like the insurrection, I think, the riot immediately kind of like makes this divide clear. It delineates it in a sense where it's like somebody, a Republican like Trump, a Republican like, you know, Holly, for example, was like, and the Trump, the Trump Republicans basically were, were in support of the riot. Of course, they wouldn't say it in the day, but in retrospect, you know, they, it was because of their sort of defiance, you know, to, to like Biden's win, for example, where it's just, it's just in general. Where it's like, I think ultimately made the riots possible. And because of that, there is this the divide that was made immediately clear. It was delineated. Now, you know, it's like initially it was like wishy washy things where it's like, oh, you know, he, he doesn't have to court and all these kinds of things. Well, now with the riot happening, this no decorum argument, well, it, it resonates in a sense where it's like, yeah, it's, it's there for everyone to see. Where it's like, you know, if you're in support of the riots, if you're in support of, you know, like stop the steal. As the movement's called, and all these kinds of and all these conspiracies. If you're for that, it means you're for the riot. You know, like just ergo, you are for the riots. Whereas, you know, if you're not, well, then you know you're a standard Republican. You know, so we have standard the standard types. You know, just being like, well, most of the people in the Senate and in the House. So it's like you know you have people like Romney, Mitt Romney, Mitch McConnell. You know, all these standard Republicans. So they're there. Then you have, you know, Trump Republicans like you know. Donald Trump, of course. Then, of course, you, then over, all, over time, you have people moving into the Trump wing of the party, or at least like trying to. You know, people like Josh Hawley, people like Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, even somewhat. So the thing is, like on the on January sixth, the day they were meant to just verify the results of the elections, there was I think at least thirteen Republicans who were saying, "No, we're not going to verify it because so and so they stole the election, so and so." But anyways, see, it was because of that defiance that I think ultimately, you know, like people within Trump circles were actually able to latch into that particular date. And it's that day that they decide, oh, hey, you know, let's do this big riot in Capitol Hill. It became what it became. Mind you, it's like, it wasn't exactly everyone that day who came in, they were saying, we're going to wreck things. Most people, you know, just wanted to come there peacefully. And to be fair, in the, in the day, protests did start out peacefully. But it was basically when Trump started opening his mouth that you know, things really started to take a turn for the worse because, you know, he started, he didn't say directly, you know, let's wreck things. He kind of like insinuated, you know, saying things like, oh, well, you know, somebody has to do something or it's like, oh, you know, see what they're doing right, right in there, you know, they're going to like ruin our country, blah, blah, blah. So basically he was implying to his supporters that, you know, we should take action. So in that moment, that was when some people took it to them upon themselves to just barge into the building and just all hell broke loose from there from that point on. But anyway, so after that, you know, so of course, you know, like the insurrection, quote unquote, kind of like failed, I guess you mean it didn't really 
achieve anything. If anything, it made Trump's chances for 2024 a lot more bleak. And now, well, now we have his impeachment trial. Which he just got acquitted for again, by the way. So initially when they were impeaching him the last time, you know, it was like something about like him calling the president of Ukraine to, you know, like look for things on Joe Biden, so and so, so and so. So it was like, it was a case in no, any normal time with any normal president, that would be a case that would be easily pursued and easily convicted. But we you know we live in interesting times. So, you know, basically with, don't, so basically in that case, you know, it's like nothing really happened. Trump got acquitted. And, you know, even for a time, his approval ratings went up right before COVID. Now, you know, when COVID happened, it just tanked immediately. Now, with this particular case, which is how, which is how Americans in general, you know, like condemn this particular client, like across the board, Democrats, Republicans, almost all of them say, you know, the riot was unacceptable, which is how universal, how uniting this issue was. And the fact that the senators and the representatives themselves, whose lives were in danger, you know, they, you know, had to like deal with the brunt of it. I think it's like now, you know, we, this, in this particular impeachment wouldn't actually see an increase in Trump's popularity and would likely handicap his run in 2024. So as of right now, Trump 2024 isn't as likely as it would have been right out of the election. Right after the, out of the election, people were saying, oh, Trump's going to run again, no doubt. And the pollings show most of the Republicans want Trump to run again in 2024. So, you know, so we have like this, like I said, a 50-50 divide where it's like the other 50% are a bit wishy-washy, ambivalent about who they would like to see as president. The Trump wing, of course, resolutely votes for Trump. So, you know, so immediately in a hypothetical Republican primary, and which is how energized his supporters are, you would see Trump easily winning any sort of primary going forward. But, you know, that was before. Now, it might actually still be easy for him to win a Republican primary, but to win the presidency, now see, that is where it becomes a bit difficult. So, but anyways, you know, so that, that happened and, you know, and if, so 2022 is coming up and that's the next big U.S. election. So that's the midterms. So, you know, there we're really going to see if, you know, any big developments happen and, you know, and, and if all the civil war talk will really manifest itself you know, to its fullest extent, because it will eventually burst on both sides, but it's just a matter of time, basically. So, you know, so just everything that's happened and it all ended in a, so after the riots, everything just kind of like died down. And, you know, and in the end, you know, it just ended in a whimper, all of this talk of like Trump not leading office and all these kinds of things, you know, things like I, I personally believed, you know, for a time that, you know, that, you know, that Trump, that there was actually a chance that Trump wouldn't actually leave office. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is like, he did, he didn't concede though, but he did leave office in the end. He actually, I think right after the riots, he actually conceded, not really conceded, but it's like, but he said, fine, you know, I guess I'm leaving, you know. At that point, there was no chance that, you know, he would have been able to stay on. So that died in a whimper, but then got inaugurated, you know, it wasn't like as big of a ceremony as usual, because COVID, but, he got inaugurated, you know, it's like, so he became the 46th president of the United States. Kamala Harris became the first female, first black, first Asian American vice president. Yeah, that's a lot. But yes, any of that happened. And, uh, you know, now we're at the Biden administration. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what, what he's actually going to do because, and this is like, a nice point to end on where it's like, you know, it's like Bernie when he dropped out and when he dropped out, left wing circles immediately said there was a faction, a lot of people who were saying, oh, you know, first day we're going to push Biden left. You know, we're going to make him progressive. And to be fair, you know, things like Bernie is currently like head, like chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, which is an influential position in that he gets actually set the budget that the Senate actually votes on. So that's, so it'll be interesting to see what, what he does with that decision. But within the first few weeks, you know, so of course, you know, Joe Biden, you know, he's done some interesting things. He's, he's done some good things, definitely. 
But, you know, at the same time, you know, he's Joe, he's Joe Biden. He's an establishment Democrat. So, of course, you know, he's going to do things, but he's not going to rock the boat all that much. You know what I mean? But anyways, well, I mean, like, whatever happens going forward election-wise, well, I guess I'll all be here to, like, report it, which is, I think, it's, like I said, the next one is 2022. Now, anyways, so, you know, so now that we have this three-part series done, and then going forward, most of it is just going to be like one podcast every two weeks. So I'm com- I'm committing to a bi-weekly schedule. So initially, I wasn't going to talk about this election because I didn't think there'd be much to say. But recently, it's kind of piqued my interest with all that's happening. So I think it's like we're going to be talking about the the Burmese election, the election in Myanmar in or well, last year, which you know which led to the coup that just happened. So we're going to be talking about that in two weeks. See you then.